Welcome to episode number three of My Dad Used to Play Hockey. I'm your host, Zach Kindrichuk. Today's guest played in almost 500 NHL games, had over 100 goals, started with the Capitals, moved on to the Avalanche, and then I know him best from his tenure at the Flyers. You might know him best uh, seeing him as a commentator on NBC Sports. Welcome, Keith Jones. Hey, Keith, how you doing? I'm doing well, Zach. Good to catch up with you again, buddy. Hey, we're going to skip past the Capitals and the Avalanche, if that's okay, at least for now. That's fine. Yeah, no problem. No Your problem. tenure with the Flyers was overall short, but you're a fan favorite. Um, how did that happen? Was it your on-ice play, or is it your amazing personality? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, go, I'll, I'll go with a mix of both. Um, I think a lot of it had to do with style of play and I think uh, obviously your dad would know <clears throat> know best, but uh, plays in Philadelphia is hard work, uh, aggressiveness, irritating the opponent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, making sure that you're trying to change the momentum in the game that might not be going the direction that uh, the home crowd wants. So I, I think by providing those things, which came fortunately for me was something that came naturally to me. Um, I was able to kind of fit in here seamlessly and, and have some measure of success in a short period of time. What kind of things would you do on the ice to change the momentum? Oh, you might punch somebody in the head. You might uh, just give them a stinky <laughs> glove. You might whisper something in their ear. You might slash them on the back of the knee. Uh, you might skate by the bench and, and uh, ask uh, who's next. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff. A lot of the stuff, actually, to be honest with you, I, I kind of built up a library of things in the back of my mind based upon things I would watch opponents do in their own games. It wouldn't necessarily be against us. I might pick something up uh, from watching a game on, on television uh, that I could use against them and kind of try to uh, embarrass them in front of their own teammates and find a little flaw that might uh, not play well within their own locker room. So it was um, a lot of it was research. A lot of it was homework and a lot huh. of it had to do with just having a love of the game and watching on off game nights. It was a, a lot of fun to watch games. And that started in Washington with Craig Berube and Dale Hunter. We would get together all the time, have a few beers and watch, uh, watch other teams play and kind of uh, get ready for the next opponent. Well, Dale, let's just talk about your beers with Dale Hunter and Craig Berube. You're talking about some legendary pests right there. Uh, what kind of tips would Dale Hunter give you? Because he, you know, he was the first player that it was ever explained to me. Like, all right, you hate him unless he's on your team, and then you absolutely love him. And and that's really part of it. I, I have a, a great story with Dale. I was just a young player. I actually took his brother Mark's job. Mark was playing for the Caps, and uh, he was injured. So I was called up and took his spot in the lineup. And uh, shortly after that, about three or four games in, Dale kind of took me under his wing and saw something in me that he thought that um, could uh, help the Capitals at the time. So we were sitting there at uh, dinner and he said, it was at my place actually at the kitchen table. And he said, uh, Jonesy, if there was $500,000 sitting on your kitchen table right now and somebody walked in the house and grabbed the $500,000 and walked out, he said, uh, well, are you going to fight him for it? And I said, yeah, of course. He said, well, start doing it on the ice. Hmm. And it, it was a, it was just a great message of, Find a, a way that you can provide something that some other players might not be. And in doing so, get yourself a spot in the NHL. And I, I took that to heart. I went and started fighting a lot more frequently my first year. Got beat up a lot in doing so. I'd never had a fight in my life before dropping the gloves in the NHL. That was the first time I'd ever – I never fought in high school. I never – I just was not part of my personality um, and I wasn't very good at it. So I just uh, started doing it and found my way into playing regularly with the Washington Capitals and, and then found myself working my way up through different lines, uh, going from the fourth line to the first line before things were all said and done. Well, tell me about the moment before your first fight. That must be, uh, you're, 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 you're obviously, you know you're going to do it. The gloves are off. 
Uh, is there any fear involved or is there just too much adrenaline? There, there's fear involved in every fight. <laughs> it's it, it never goes away and it shouldn't. I think if it does, that's probably when you're going to get knocked out. So I was uh, fortunate in uh, some of my fights. I was able to survive and uh, I, I didn't get killed too badly. But there, there's no question that heart is pumping and mm -hmm. you know you're into something and you're you're exhausted after, even though it might only last 40 seconds, it seems like an eternity. And, and a lot, in many cases you're learning on the go. I never took boxing lessons or hit a heavy bag or did anything like that. It was just instinct and trying to survive and trying to do something to, uh, to get your teammates going at the same time, making sure that you were accountable for, um, for yourself and for making sure you did the right things for your teammates on the ice. And that was a, uh, that was a challenging thing to kind of fight through. And a lot of players never really got through it back in the day. And for many of those guys, they didn't end up playing in the national hockey league for fear of getting punched out or getting embarrassed or, or just not uh, having the willingness to, to do whatever it took for your teammates. Was there ever one where as soon as the gloves came off, you were thinking this was a big mistake? Yeah, I had a, a fight with Richie Pilon that uh, anybody can look it up on YouTube. I'm lucky to be alive after that fight, but <laughs> I, I didn't know exactly who I wa who he was. It was my rookie year, and we were playing the Islanders in the playoffs. The same year that Dale Hunter ran Pierre Turgeon after he scored a goal, Dale ran him about 20 seconds after the goal was scored during his <laughs> celebration, but got a 25-game suspension for that. Um, but earlier in the series, I fought Richie Pilon. It was a bit of a uh, scrum going on on the ice and I thought you know what I'll, I'll take the guy with the visor he can't be that tough well un unbeknownst to me uh, Richie Pilon had had an eye injury and was wearing the visor uh, because out of necessity not because he he was uh, not a tough player and back, right. back in those days if you remember that was amazingly that was a sign that you weren't as tough as everybody else which obviously should never have been that way but Lesson learned there. I dropped the gloves and I got a couple punches in. And then I found out that Richie Pilon not only throws right hand, he throws left handed equally as well. <laughs> and smacked my head a few times. My helmet went flying across the ice. And remarkably, I survived after that. But you'll see if you watch it, there's one punch that uh, could have ended it all for me. So I was, I was an eye opening experience. I got back to the bench after the fight. And uh, I think it was Dale Hunter said to me, what are you doing? And I'm like, what? He said, do you know who that is? I go, well, I do now. I didn't know then. So I, I avoided him from that point on in my career. I you wasn't think looking for redemption. Probably now you would get that scouting report. That Okay. Yeah. There's other yeah, players you should you maybe go after. Yeah, that's it's interesting because when I came out of college – you know, the only games we would get in the NHL were on the big satellite dish if somebody on your team happened to have one in their apartment. And it was before the direct TV days, or at least they were just getting started then. There was the gigantic satellite that you would get Sports Channel America and uh, watch Eddie Westfall and Jiggs McDonald do an Islanders games if you were lucky. So you, I really was not that familiar with the NHL, I had, you know, obviously my heroes that I watched that would play long into the playoffs, but for, you know, obscure players that you didn't see a whole lot, uh, I was not that familiar with them. So it was kind of learn on the fly. And that might have served me well because I may have been a little more fearless than I might have been had I been watching some of the things mm -hmm. that some of those players had done to others. Well, I have watched that. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, Jonesy, that is, if you type in your name, it's top three results on YouTube. Yeah, I, I bet I you wish it, it was a I glorious goal. Was. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, afterwards, yeah. because you're 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 the first non-bully Broad Street bully that I've talked to. Um, a different era, and this was this was more the era that I grew up watching. Um, what, what would you just? How would you describe the identity of the Flyers team that that you played for? Because obviously, the fans were still kind of clamoring for bully style hockey. If you if you, you know, won over the city's heart in just a two and a half years. Yeah, it was, uh, we were still a tough team and I had tough players around me, which made all of us a little tougher than we probably were. Um, Sandy McCarthy was there. Gino Ojik stopped by. Craig Berube was with us. 
Uh, Rick Tockett was with us. Luke Richardson was with us. Uh, we had a long list of guys that um, without question could match up to the intimidators on the opposition. And it made for some great, you know, some great games with a lot of physicality. And I think that was entertaining to the fans. And, uh, you know, Craig Berube called me Don King. He said, I set up the fights. So <laughs> I would I would irritate the opposition. And then Craig Berube would come and drop his gloves and beat up a few guys along the way. In fact, I had players come up to me. I think it was Brad May when I was at, we were playing against Vancouver. And we're at the face-off circle. And he comes up and he looks at me. I knew him a little bit from couple of uh, charity golf tournaments and he looks at me, he goes, do you fight? And I'm like, yeah, but not you, but I got a guy that will fight you. Just a minute. And I, I went over to Ruby and he came out and I think moments later, the two of them were fighting, but that's, that's kind of some of the stuff that would happen during a game. That's there's this kind of a gentlemanly um, aspect to that. You know, instead there, there, of, can, there can be, there can yeah. be as long as you did, as long as you didn't do something so, outlandish or you know something that you couldn't come back from you know if it was a dirty hit let's say you ran somebody from behind which wasn't something that I did very frequently I was only suspended once in my career for a couple of games and that was kind of a uh, it was an iffy iffy play I kind of took uh, Curtis I think it was Curtis Brown and took the back of his head and kind of slammed it into the edge of the boards where the glass meets Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't as it wasn't as bad as it visually appeared, but uh, under review when I went over it with Coley Campbell and he uh, was explaining to me how he saw it, I, I agreed with him and uh, received a two game suspension for it. But that was the only time um, I, I didn't try to uh, go out of my way to hurt somebody, but I did like to uh, get 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 them rattled and get them off their game. And arguably, you, I, 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 I've seen this argument quite a bit lately, you might have played with the greatest flyer fighter of all time, Eric Lindros, I mean, just because he was just so, he was a, a bear, you know, fighting a much, uh, basically a deer. He just by sheer size, he could just pummel all the players. Yeah. You know, Zach, I fought him when I was with the Washington Capitals. Uh, it was a exhibition game at the spectrum and about three minutes left in the game, Terry Murray was coaching us. I know you know Terry, and mm -hmm. he and went on to coach the Flyers and also play in the organization. But Terry was the coach of the Capitals, and I think 93, 94 season. And about three, maybe two and a half minutes left, he puts me out at center, which I rarely played, almost never played. And Craig Berube's on the left side, Alan Mays on my right side. And I look across, and Lindros is at center for the flyers and there's a couple other big boys beside him and i i can see lindros kind of doing the math in his head he's thinking well, i don't want to fight me and i don't want to fight barube although he probably could have done quite well against either guy i'm going to take this guy and beat the living hell out of him so the puck drops and he throws like i don't know maybe 15 or 16 punches at me and i'm, I'm way over my over my skis right but near the end of it i kind of pop my arm up and i give him a little shot and i barely even hit him but the linesman kind of tripped him up and he fell down and i skated off the ice in the spectrum with my arms in the air like i had won the fight it was, it was pretty funny but afterwards david david poyle was the gm in washington he comes up to me and he goes you know, maybe you should leave your gloves on and just bother guys a little bit more and not worry about fighting. That didn't go very well for you. And I'm thinking, yeah, thanks, pal. <laughs> I, I didn't choose to go out there and fight this guy. But, yeah, that's – Lindros was a machine. Um, he was a, a player that brought their fans – the fans out of their seats. And people paid to watch Eric Lindros play. And that's something that probably should never be forgotten. A big reason why Eric's in the Hockey Hall of Fame. And I, I don't, I don't think his career kind of went to the level that his potential would have taken it due to injury. But he was a he was a physical specimen that had all the talent, the hands, the skills, and practiced as hard as anyone I'd seen before. Um, he was a tremendously hardworking player in practice, and that's something I always respected about the way he played. Now, Keith. Uh, uh the couple of players that I've talked to be so far, Dave Schultz and Bernie Perrant, 
had trouble transitioning to life after hockey. Um, and you, I'm not going to say it was seamless, but it seemed like you, you kind of had it figured out that, all right, this isn't going to last forever. Uh, I got to figure out what to do with the next 50 some years of my life. Was that, was that something that you just put upon yourself or were there other players or your agent or a coach who kind of helped you start preparing for life after hockey? Yeah, I kind of stumbled into it, to be honest with you, Zach. I had uh, retired abruptly. I had taken a a ride up to Hartford to get a 15th opinion on my knee and uh, was hoping that the doctor would have a, you know, a recipe to fix it. And the guy named Dr. Falkerson, who used to be the Whalers team doctor when Paul Holmgren was there back in the day. And I thought he was going to tell me we got to do this and this, and this is going to fix it. And he came back in the room and he asked me if I like golf. And I, hmm. I said, uh, not really. He said, well, you should start playing because you're not going to play hockey again with this knee. <clears throat> so fortunately for me, I still had a little bit of contract left. Uh, I had a year and a half left of my contract. And uh, Mr. Snyder was such a great gentleman about everything called me wasn't concerned about anything other than the fact that I had to retire. And, um, I kind of stumbled into doing television, uh, right away at ESPN. I had a, a 15 game contract with them to do ESPN, uh, NHL tonight and was awful at it. <clears throat> Hated every second of it. I was sweating like broadcast news. I <laughs> was extremely uncomfortable and had no idea what went into it. And I had for many years been ripping on guys on TV that I watched try to do that very job and uh, thought they were awful at it. And then come to realize I was a hell of a lot worse than they were. So it was a really, really uh, scary time, to be honest with you. Would I have yeah. noticed as, as the viewer or did you just think – you would have noticed. I would have noticed. And I, and I knew that you would notice. And that was a bigger problem for me because I had been so, <clears throat> you know, outspokenly critical, you know, amongst friends and teammates about such and such. You know what I mean? It didn't matter who it was. They were actually really good. Um, but I thought I had it all figured out and I did not. Um, so after 15 games, I probably did okay in the last three or four of them. But the first 10 were really bad. And I was not asked to come back and nor would I have asked my me to come back if I was them. So I was lucky enough to then still have an opportunity with Comcast Sportsnet at that time who had just started doing post game shows. They weren't even in existence prior to to the uh, year before I retired and they were in their infancy. Um I used to do it with a guy named Al Meltzer and then with Michael Barkan and we would just casually sit in chairs. Steve Coates, of course, was part of it as well. Eddie Hospidar when I started. And we would just kind of sit there and kind of do a post-game wrap of what happened in the game, sitting in these awful orange chairs and, <laughs> and uh, poorly dressed and uh, just kind of casually talking hockey but getting better at it uh, with more repetition. And Al Morgani would join us too. And then Al and I started doing a show uh, once a week called Spotlight. And then uh, at the same time, I was doing morning radio. And that was the first contract that I ever, you know, kind of received after retiring from hockey. And it took a year and a half of doing that job for free on WIP with Angelo Cataldi. And I just would show up once or twice a week and kind of evolved into the show and kind of all of a sudden was part of the show and it stayed that way for the last 21 years. So I don't know if I would have done as well without the radio experience. Uh, I don't think I would have ever really figured out the timing of things and what was important and what's not um, allowing someone else to speak, not over, you know, having two mics going at the same time, two voices on, uh, different microphones at the same time leads to noise. It's, uh, you know, just all the little things that go into <clears throat> putting what you hope is a good uh, broadcast and a, and a decent message uh, as far as 
the things that you're talking about. If it's hockey, you want to make sure you're giving the fans what uh, what they need and also entertaining at the same time. So it uh, it was not an easy process. I'm extremely happy that it turned out the way it did because I really don't know what I would be doing right now if it didn't. Well, Cataldi's show is it's it's obviously on WIP, the the sports station of Philadelphia, the the, the bigger one anyway. Yeah, but it's I think that people. People care more, obviously, about the personalities, about Al and Rhea and and you. Did that help you realize that, okay, there's X's and O's stuff that's good for a show like NHL Tonight, maybe, like, you know, here's what led to that two-on-one. But then there's also injecting the personality into talking about sports that I think makes sports radio, at least the, the successful stations, um, garner listeners who aren't necessarily interested in all the fine details of the game. It, it was a perfect fit for me because I have always loved to joke around. I've always uh, been fortunate enough to seem to come up with the right line at the right time. Um, and timing is everything and, and being humorous, but not being hurtful. Um, there, there's a real balance to, to that and, Fortunately for me, it came naturally to me. Unlike fighting back nah. in the day, this did come naturally to me, and it was a, it was just a perfect fit. You know, told a couple borderline dirty jokes back in the day, and that started to, you know, show my personality a little bit, and then just kind of everything fell into place. I, if I, if I knew then what I know now, I probably would have been less likely to succeed because I would have been fearful of losing the opportunity to have that job. Um, and I think it's really something that comes into play for a lot of people. When when you need something, which I didn't know at the time I would need, but obviously I had a long life to live and I retired at the age of 31. And what, what I made in hockey was not going to be, you know, sustaining that uh, lifestyle and all the great things that I've been able to have in my life, uh, I would not have been able to do those things without finding a, another career and extending my uh, workforce life. Um, so I, I, I'm just really happy that I didn't know that much. And I just kind of went in there and didn't ever act like I needed it. And I think there, that's a key to doing that type of job. You, you never want people around to know that it's something that you really need. There's, I think you're less likely to succeed and less likely to get opportunities. So I would conceal that if I was a young person trying to, to, to make it in the world. And yeah. I would try to demonstrate that you had a carefree attitude, but it's really hard to do when, you know, you're, you're worried about uh, your next paycheck. True. I mean, you, uh, you did have that, that remaining contract that allowed you to do a year and a, a year and a half long audition. It's true. Yeah, no, that was uh that was a real gift, I, I will tell you that. And it gave me, and trust me, I, I thought that I was the wealthiest man in the world. I, I never played hockey for the money. I just felt inside that it was like this incredible um, feeling of fulfillment and you know living a childhood dream and then uh, getting paid for it. It was pretty neat too, but it mm -hmm. wasn't what the driving force was and getting there and it wasn't the driving force when I played, but it was a, a nice added bonus for sure. And you, let's talk about your TV career a little bit. You were actually on Versus yep. before Versus became NBC Sports. And Versus took over for, I think, the most poorly branded network to ever exist that the NHL used to be broadcast on. And that was the Outdoor Life Network. Uh, Versus was an upgrade from that, sure. Um, but still didn't have it didn't have this this huge brand with it to like the way NBC Sports did. Um, how how what's it been like to watch those changes kind of get implemented? It's an ever changing business, and we're we're still changing right now because things are shifting back. Uh, you know, to ESPN in some ways, and we're still kind of waiting to hear if NBC is going to keep their the other half of it. A lot of uncertainties, but that is the nature of the business. So. When I started an outdoor life network, that was with our good friend, Bill Clement. Mm -hmm. And that was after the NHL lockout in 2005, uh, the NHL had no home. They had no place for hockey. ESPN walked away and Comcast stepped in and took it over. 
And the only available channel at that time to put it on because of the short notice was the Outdoor Life Network. So yes. I, I, I auditioned for a job, thanks to Bill. And he was going to be the host. And we went to Norwalk, Connecticut, in this little tiny studio, sat down and started uh, analyzing hockey games from a year prior because there hadn't been no game. There hadn't been a game in a year. Mm -hmm. So we were doing some studio stuff. Uh, Mike Richter was there, Pat Lafontaine, some some really a lot bigger names than I was. And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I'd been doing Comcast Sportsnet for the five previous years and was a lot more comfortable than I was when I showed up at ESPN five or six years prior to that. Um, so the audition went well, but uh, I just give a lot of uh, thanks to Bill uh, for, uh, you know, getting me in there for the opportunity. And then we just kind of started at uh, the ground floor. We had nothing. We are our shot sheets, which are sheets that are handed on to, you know, the the uh, talent to, to go over the highlights. It's kind of a note of who scored the goal and you can mm -hmm. kind of use it as a base. They would be handwritten and slid down a, like a clothesline to us from way up above. And we had to grab them, pull them down and read on the one kid. I remember Bill looking at the writing. He goes, what is this? It looks like a ransom note. He says, <laughs> the, guy, the kid could barely write. Uh, it was just, it, it's incredible that, it came as far as it, um, it has because we started with virtually nothing. And, well, because uh, again, you were on the Outdoor Life Network, and now I'm, yeah. there's the Winter Classic, which I guess technically the NHL has three or four outdoor games. But I remember, and I'm always I'm always trying to get people to watch the NHL, even though it's it can be a tough sport for someone who's sure. novice to it. Yep. But it was never harder than in that era for the NHL because nobody knew what OLN was. And then the lead-in to an, an NHL game would be someone either fishing or shooting a buck, and then be like, here's hockey. And then afterwards, it would be bear hunting. <laughs> it was, it was the weirdest programming lineup. It, it's, you know, it's and that's been the case with the hockey for a long time. It, even like the regional networks, a lot of them you know, have a lot of fishing shows that lead into mm -hmm. the game. And, you know, hockey has been predominantly a regional sport for forever. I mean, there's avid hockey fans in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Flyers. But when the Flyers season ends, they are less likely to continue to watch hockey. They'll move on and start watching the Phillies. And, I, and that's very common in a lot of different cities. So you need superstar talents and you need to sell them if you're going to, you know, keep certain casual fans watching when their team is beat out. And the league's got them now. You know, they've been playing yeah. David and. There's uh there's some real stars and there's villains too, like in Philadelphia, the the Crosby flyer relationship, which is it's a lot more friendly now than it used to be, but it got pretty heated for a while, and that was for made for some really entertaining entertaining games. But the I one I'm going to give the NBA some credit here for a second. I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on how maybe the NHL could parallel this. The NBA was like the NHL forever. I mean, extremely extremely regional, and now. Because they have, you know, they have their heroes, they have their villains. They've done an incredible job marketing. Um, I'll watch, I'll watch an out of market game all the time. Um, yep. And I, you know, yep. ten years ago, I was a very, very casual fan. Um, but I'll watch Philly just as I'm just as likely to watch Philly as I am Milwaukee or you know the Los Angeles or you know the Trailblazers. Do you think the NHL? You know, you mentioned they've got the players, but. In in the eighties, Wayne Gretzky was as famous as a name as any athlete, as famous as Magic Johnson. Connor McDavid could be closer to that level. Um, you know, he's not the all time great, but he's certainly the greatest in the game right now. Do you think the NHL could do a better job getting these players into more households so people are talking about Connor McDavid, even though they live in Orlando? They would be if he made it to the playoffs more often. And here's the challenge for the NHL, where the NBA has an advantage. There's five players on the court, uh, and three or four of them are superstars. And if you have three or four superstars, you're going to go deep in the playoffs. And if you don't, you know, you're going to be eliminated and people aren't really going to know a whole lot about your team. The, the NBA stars go on extended playoff runs and win championships. Their best players win it all. 
and there's it's less likely that you know a team like Carolina is going to make it to an NBA final and a comparable team because Carolina's team could make it to the final much more than a team that doesn't have a bunch of stars in the NBA. Eight seeds aren't making it to the NBA final. Mm -hmm. So there is a bit of an advantage with that. There's less players to market and the stars are incredibly great players and also seem to have uh, terrific personalities. Our players are less uh, flamboyant. They're mm -hmm. less um, self-promotional, if that's a word even. Like they, they are all about team and a lot of the promos that are run are really not mocking the way that they act, but it's always like, yeah, we, we got to do a better job. We got, yeah. you know, it's all, it's all a lot of, um, a lot of team first answers and mentality. And it, in that regard, it makes them a little bit less marketable. Yeah. And, but I do think, you know, obviously there's, there's a better job that can be done for sure. Would that um, be, would it be, would it be worth training the players? To you know, it, send it them is. to a, send them to an improv class or something like that because you know, um, obviously none of my guests fall into this category, but NHL players are notoriously bad interviews, especially in post game press conferences because they do they do kind of default into those cliches, you know, given a hundred percent. Yep. You know, there's twelve. You know, all these I, things. I will tell you, I will one great example for hockey where it's worked is Chicago and they did a great job of marketing their star players in that city. Mm -hmm. Obviously it's a great city and that matters. There's a ton of fans that were uh, awakened in Chicago when they became a good team. Again, they started to sell out every night, but they had commercials everywhere on, um, on television, promoting their stars advertisements. They did an unbelievably good job of marketing the Hawks, and uh, you think of Taves and Kane, Patrick Sharp, who I work with at NBC, uh, Duncan Keith, for instance. Mm -hmm. You couldn't go anywhere without seeing a billboard, uh, TV commercial in Chicago about their players. So it does work. And those guys did a great job of getting out there and, and having some fun in their ads and, and uh, really did a really uh, an outstanding job of selling hockey again in Chicago. And, and it worked. So I guess there is something to be said about uh, – the players buying into it mm -hmm. and really going out of their way instead, even in a, in a basic interview, just being honest and, you know, just giving a, sm a smile, just giving the emotional response. Those things are pretty cool. And it goes a long way in giving people the opportunity to get to know the player. And yeah. that it only serves the player well in his career and post career as well. If people know you a little bit better than just, Yes, no, and a hundred percent, and all those uh, answers that are given far too often, and from the players. In the in with, with the color commentating that you're doing now, have you seen a, a sort of a shift in that same direction? You know, I'll compare your show to uh, again the, the sh a show that the NBA runs, which I think is the highest rated like 15 minute segment of any game, and that's the that's the halftime show on TNT where you have you know Charles Barkley and Shaquille O'Neal. Who are wrong constantly about their analysis, but are really funny. So people love the show. They do a great job with it. I watch it. Uh, Charles is one of my favorite people. Uh, when you meet Charles, he just lights up the entire room, and he does the same thing on on camera. He's one in a million. Like I, 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 I think he would be. He's next to impossible to replicate. It's mm -hmm. it's funny. Hockey had Don Cherry forever um, in Toronto, and he was much must see TV for Canadians. And now he's, you know, he's obviously older, but also kind of got bumped out near the end. Yeah. Um, that we, we haven't had a guy in hockey that's really come close to being able to do what Charles does. And that would, that would help. That would go a long way. I mean, yeah. there's, there is something to be said for that. And it's, I think that that's what um, ideally everybody would love to try to get to. I, it's really hard to get to it. It's really tough to get to it. So fingers crossed on that, but I do think it helps that their star players are as marketable as they are. Yeah. And they, and they have, and it's an amazing gambling sport as well. Something that hockey is obviously available to gamble in a lot of States now, but basketball is, 
is a sport that people love to bet on. The line is constantly moving and in-game betting is huge. Um, I think that's only going to help both sports. The gambling part will uh, have more eyes on, you know, the the two sports. But I think basketball gets a bit of an advantage in that regard. Well, uh, you know, Charles Barkley has revealed himself to be a, an NHL fan, so maybe maybe the league oh, yeah. could just poach him. We've had him. We've had him on in the finals yeah. before, and he he comes and lights up the whole set. He does. He's, he is uh, he is who you want to be if you're in television. It's just hard to be Charles. Last couple of questions here, Jonesy, are about your memoir. Uh, Jonesy, uh, colon, put your head down and skate. With a foreword, a very impressive foreword by Ray Bork. Uh, right, right. <laughs> what inspired you to put pen to paper? And, you know I, know, I know you had some help, but all players have some help. And decide to tell, you know, what you're, about your experiences in hockey. It was actually a, a favor for John Bucigras, who wrote the book. He was trying, he wanted to write one. He gave a list of, um, I think, eight or 10 potential people that he would like to write the book on. And it happened to be that the publisher was from Philadelphia. Uh, so that's why the publisher said, hey, if you can get Keith Jones and uh, we'll do it. So that's how that's how it all came about. It wasn't. It was not that enjoyable of an experience. It's kind of a hard thing to do, and it's it's done through conversation, like you and I are talking right now, telling stories and you know walking around, just John taping them and then putting them on. I don't know how he did it, to be honest with you. It's a lot of work, um, and it's it's not an easy thing to do. So I I'm I'm glad we did it, and it was for charity. All the proceeds went to, went to Alex's lemonade stand. But I would not, I would not be able to really tell all the true stories that Why not? everybody. But it's just because they're, in some cases, it would be, um, it would be a problem for other people. Like some things that made me look good would make somebody else look bad. Mm -hmm. And the funniest stories, there might be someone that's, you know, that was getting hurt, not hurt badly on the other side, but someone that looks could look poorly because of the way things played out. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's, that was probably the toughest part of it, but we got enough in there. People liked it. Um, it was John's first book too. So it was not, I think it was a little bit challenging. The editor didn't do a fabulous job. Uh, the title of the book is probably the best part of the book. Cause that's all I did when, whenever things got tough and, uh, we'd been losing a bunch of games and the uh, coaches skating you and I would just put my head down and get through it. I, I hated getting skated in practice. It was one of the biggest, biggest uh, pet peeves of my career. I just absolutely hated punishment skates in hockey. And I I would just put my head down and get through it. And I, it's kind of the way I look at life sometimes when you're getting hit over the head a few times. Sometimes just put it down and try to barrel through it. I know everyone's got a bunch of things they're trying to get through, especially now. Mm -hmm. um, you just got to get to the other side if you can. So is there anything else you want to do, Jonesy, or are you just going to broadcast until someone says, don't come in the studio anymore, we got someone else? It's a great question. Um, I I think I, I would, I, I've really enjoyed broadcasting. I, it's something that I believe if you're going to be a broadcaster, you have to be a broadcaster and not be looking to try to be something else. Um, I think if I my real aspiration was to be a general manager or a coach. I couldn't do the job that I'm doing now properly. So I, I, I think that my, my mind being a broadcaster is what I love to be. So that's all I want to be. If there was a necessity and I had to make a change, I obviously would do that, but I would prefer to stay a broadcaster. And I, and I do think it's important that while you're doing that, that's what you're doing. You're not looking for other jobs. You're not putting your name out for this. You're not just give your honest opinion on, on what's in front of you and don't try to give it that in a way that makes you look better so you can get a job somewhere else down the road. I've, I've never approached it like that. And I never will. Mm -hmm. Keith Jones, uh, former flyer, NBC uh, sports commentator, my third guest on my dad used to play hockey. I appreciate your time this morning. Love to do it, Zach. Great to catch up with you too, uh, as All right. well. Talk to you soon. You got it. See you, pal. See ya.